So in this session, I'm going to tell you a story, a story that represents how we think the universe started in a very hot, very dense state and how it changed over time to the kind of universe that we see around us today. There are a lot of open questions about this timeline. There is a lot of parts of this that are still very active er areas of research, especially some of these earliest eras. We don't know very much at all about the very, very beginning of the Big Bang. We'll talk in a little bit of detail about some of the models that are trying to describe and some of the efforts that are currently underway to try to get a better understanding of this, these earliest eras. But again, there is a lot that we don't know. So for this session, I'm going to try to give the overall timeline of the Big Bang model. And then in some of the next sessions, we'll talk about, well, what is our evidence that gives us confidence that this model is accurate? Does it make testable predictions? Can we go and look for direct evidence that this Big Bang model, uh, whether or not this Big Bang model is correct or not? So that's what we're going to be talking about this uh, session. So some of the stuff that we just talked about with that overview of the Big Bang uh, background, we said that the universe expands from the Big Bang. It starts in this very hot, dense state, and then rapidly goes through this period of expansion. And as it expands, it cools down. The forces separate. Uh, the four fundamental forces that we're going to talk about are going to separate. And as temperature goes down, matter is going to clump together from subatomic particles to protons, nuclei, atomic nucleus, um, uh, to atoms and stars and galaxies. This is going to tie in to a lot of the preamble stuff uh, that we talked about. So I'll be referencing a lot of these things as we go through a successive set of approximations as to what this timeline actually looks like. Uh, to also help out with this, I have put together, and this is going to look a little bit scary at first, I have put together this kind of detailed timeline of what's happening in the events in each of these different eras. But again, we're still going to be able to use a general approximation for a lot of these parts. Um, the forces are going to separate into all of the uh, fundamental forces that we know of. Uh, particles, at a certain point, particles start combine, uh, quarks start combining into protons and neutrons. Protons start uh, combining into helium nuclei. Uh, eventually, we get stable atoms. And again, kind of identifying these different stages of the Big Bang model and what was happening, uh, what the timeline looks like, and some of the general properties. So we'll be going through this in uh, a set of steps of increasing detail. So this is kind of the fullest level of detail, but let's start out a little bit more generally just talking about these Big Bang eras. Again, the overall picture is that the universe is expanding and cooling. And in the earliest eras, those forces are gonna separate into the four known fundamental forces. So the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force and gravity. And then as the, as the universe expands and cools, matter is going to clump together from our elementary particles, quarks, electrons, and, proton, and photons. Uh, quarks are going to start to form into protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons start fusing into atomic nuclei. And atomic nuclei eventually are able to capture electrons and make neutral atoms. And then after that, uh, gravity is going to take over and start getting these clumps of matter to be pulled together into the first galaxies, into the first stars, and start uh, going through that star gas star cycle, making heavier elements, and eventually giving us the universe that we see around us today. So let's talk about some of these very, very early eras. So on this diagram, we're looking at some of these earliest eras, the Planck era, the GUT era, the Grand Unified Theory era, and the Electro Week era. So in these earliest parts, the universe is filled with all these fundamental particles. You just got quarks, electrons, and photons. If anything tried to start to form together, like if some of these quarks started to form into protons and neutrons, 
there's so many high energy photons flying around that they're just going to bash those quarks back into their, bash those protons and neutrons back into their constituent quarks. But so we're going to get uh, quarks, anti-quarks, electrons, anti-electrons, neutrinos, anti-neutrinos, and lots of photons, a very, very large number of photons in this. And in these early eras, well, we start out with all of the forces possibly, again, we don't know for sure, uh, but possibly united into one force. And then as the temperature decreases and the forces go down, first gravity breaks away uh, from the other forces. So we've got gravity and this grand unified theory force. Then the strong nuclear force breaks away from that one. We've got the strong nuclear force, this electroweak force and the gravity force. And then eventually all of those forces separate. So in these earliest eras, let's uh, start making uh, another timeline here. So earliest eras, Uh, the Planck era, the GUT era, and the Electroweak era, uh, the forces separate from one into four. So the forces gradually separate. In terms of the timeline, again, we're talking a very, very brief period of time. We're talking about these things as eras. Some, All of these eras that we've talked about so far uh, that we've started introducing, the Planck era, the GUT era, and the Electroweak era, that's all within the first one ten billionth of a second. So by the time we get to this point, only one ten billionth of a second has happened, 10 to the minus 10 seconds. So again, that first era all occur, those first three eras all occur within the first one ten billionth of a second. But this is going to be an important marker for us because at the end of this uh, first set of uh, eras, at the end of this first set of times, when we get to this first one ten billionth of a second, at this point, all the forces have separated And we can actually reach these kinds of energies in particle accelerators. So we can test uh, these energies in particle accelerators. So we actually have experimental data that tells us what the universe would have been like right near the end of this electroweak era. We've actually been able to simulate this uh, electroweak force to uh, of varying degrees. Um, we have some pretty strong experimental evidence from particle physics about this electroweak force and how at certain energies, these forces will look different. One one kind of analogy I like to use for identifying, well, how does the how do these forces kind of separate from one force into three force? One analogy, it's not perfect, but I kind of like to use this analogy. Imagine, think about water. If I have water at a super, super high temperature, it's going to be just water vapor. It's going to be steam. As I gradually lower the temperature, well, eventually water will be liquid water will be able to condense out of that steam. So I can have an, uh, a point where, oh, I've got some liquid water and I've got some steam. They now look different from each other. It started as just one thing, just these individual water molecules. And now it looks like two things, steam and liquid water. If I lower the temperature even more, well, we're still going to have some water vapor in the air. 
we're still going to have some liquid water, but some of that water might start to freeze. So as I change the temperature more, well, what did originally look at like just a whole bunch of individual water molecules, now they're acting in kind of different ways. The gas, liquid, and solid states of water. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's kind of similar to how at very early times, we think the universe started with this one super force. We, again, this could very well be wrong, but um, some of these forces might have started as united. And as the temperature went down, those forces finally started to break off from each other and look a little bit different. We, in fact, even talk about these as phase transitions, like uh, talking about water changing from solid to liquid to gas. So again, by the end of these eras, all of those forces have separated from each other. Then we get to some of these next eras, the particle era, uh, the era of nucleosynthesis, the era of nuclei, and the era of atoms. And just to kind of point out a couple of the times on this timeline, the end of this era of nucleosynthesis, that's around three minutes in. So about the three minute mark into, you know, three minutes after the Big Bang. Uh, the end of the era of nuclei, this is about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And the era of atoms, sometimes we break that into the era of galaxies as well, extends to today. So what's going on in this set of eras is that in these eras, the matter is going to start clumping together. We said, well, with these different kinds of matter, we said, well, quarks are gonna clump together to form protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons will clump together to form atomic nuclei. And eventually, when the temperature gets low enough, those atomic nuclei are going to capture the free electrons and form atoms. Basically corresponding with the names of each of these eras. But again, we're going to be going through these in, in more detail. At first, in these early eras, the universe is so energetic. There are so many high energy photons flying around that we can actually have these particle creation reactions that we're talking about. High energy photons are going to be constantly making pairs of particles and antiparticles. And at the same time, those particles and antiparticles are going to be coming back together, annihilating with each other and forming more photons. So early on, both of these reactions are going back and forth and creating lots of high energy light and lots of matter and antimatter reactions. But eventually, as the temperatures go down, eventually we don't have any more gamma rays to undergo these particle creation reactions. So eventually, the particle creation stops and only these annihilation reactions go through. For some reason that we don't really understand, there was just a tiny bit more matter than antimatter. And I mean just a tiny amount more. It's estimated that for every 10 billion antimatter particles, there was 10 billion and one matter particles. So just one part in 10 billion difference. But those particles and antiparticles, they're going to start annihilating with each other and eventually just leaving behind that tiny little extra bit of ordinary matter. And that is what everything that we see in the universe is made up of. Just that tiny extra little bit of, ant of uh, matter that was present in slightly greater quantities than the antimatter. Again, why that's the case, we don't really know. And by the end of the era of particles, 
uh, by the end of this particle era, there's no more antimatter in the universe, at least none on large scales that's, you know, just out there on its own. So in these early eras, we have lots of matter and antimatter, but by the end of the era of particles, no more antimatter left. So again, matter clumps together from subatomic particles into atomic nuclei, atoms, and eventually we get to the point where the universe has a distribution of matter that's almost uniform, except a couple of regions that are slightly higher density. So we would have a higher density clump over here, lower density in between, another high density clump over here. And those higher density clumps are going to eventually be pulled together by gravity and form the seeds of super clusters of galaxies. In those slightly denser regions, those are the seeds of first generation star formation, the formations of galaxies and clusters and super clusters of these galaxies. Um, that's what's going to eventually form out of this material. So this early universe, by the end of, uh, in fact, by the end of this era of nucleosynthesis, the early universe would be three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium, and essentially nothing heavier than that. It would have just been the hydrogen and helium and a tiny trace amount of lithium. Everything else on the periodic table would have had to have formed inside of the cores of earlier generations of stars. So once gravity is finally able to start clumping this matter together to form stars, those stars fuse hydrogen in their core, eventually they start fusing helium into carbon, carbon and helium into oxygen, and start filling out the periodic table with all of the elements that we are literally made of. That's the star gas star cycle that we talked about uh, in earlier sessions. So again, that's kind of the uh, the first approximation look at the different eras of the Big Bang. We have the universe continually expanding and cooling. In these first few eras, the forces separate. In later eras, matter is going to clump together, and again, that also matches up with these with this kind of uh, more detailed picture. In the first couple eras, what's happening? Well, uh, these forces are separating from each other. So we get all four forces are separated at the end of the electroweak era. Then quarks start combining into protons and neutrons. And we're going to talk about some of these other eras and how matter is clumping together to form uh, heavier and heavier materials, uh, more and more complicated materials. So again, we're going to go into more details, and I do especially want to emphasize now, we have very different levels of understanding of what's happening in each of these eras. We can test up to the electroweak era how physics works at those kinds of energies and at those kinds of temperatures. A little bit further back, we have some reasonably reliable uh, scientific models of what these forces should do at higher energies. But getting back much further than that, it becomes more and more um, that extrapolation becomes more and more difficult to do. So I'm going to try to emphasize on, I'm going to try to emphasize what we think happens at the beginning or end of each era. And again, we'll be talking about what sort of things, what sort of data do we have to back this up, uh, this particular model for the Big Bang. So let's start with the Planck era. From time zero to 10 to the minus 43 seconds, that's 0 0.0000000, 35 more zeros, I think, uh, one that extremely, extremely short time period, we refer to this as the Planck era. What was going on in this Planck era? We don't really know. Uh, current theories cannot explain what the universe would look like under such extreme conditions, under that 
ridiculously high temperatures, those ridiculously high densities, we don't know what would happen. In order to try to answer this question, we would need a, a physical theory that mixes both general relativity, our understanding of gravity, and quantum mechanics, our understanding of the physics of the very small. But right now, trying to mix together those theories has resulted in a lot of kind of errors. Those two theories do not like to mix with each other. When you try to mix them, they give you nonsense answers. So current methods in uh, things like string theory, quantum gravity, they're trying to develop the framework to describe what physics would look like in these kinds of extreme conditions. For the very earliest moments of the universe, we don't know what happens. Um, most scientists do not think that the universe just started from nothing. Uh, some scientists think that um, the earliest parts of the universe, that's when time itself began. So talking about what happened before the Big Bang is kind of a nonsense question. It's like saying, if you were at the South Pole, what is south of the South Pole? If you're at the South Pole and you have a compass, everywhere you look is north. So there is no such thing as what is south of the South Pole. It might be that the question of what happened before the Big Bang is a similar kind of invalid question. Um, others have proposed that maybe... Um, in the earliest part of the universe, we have this high region of something called entropy, and the universe expands in both directions, but time acts differently on those two different directions. You may have heard of multiverse theories, where maybe there is a cosmos where our universe is just one tiny part of this greater multiverse cosmos. Um, again, there's still a lot of open questions. We can't really put these... If we can't really put these to the test, then there's even some debate as to whether some of these ideas are even something that can be explored using the scientific method. So again, my point here is that we really don't understand a lot about the Planck era. Anyone who says that um, we know about this or this is what, science, what all scientists say, no, there's a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of kind of ideas out there but we're looking for ways to say, how can we better test our ideas of what the earliest points of the universe were actually like? Uh, I will try to get off my soapbox for that one now. Um, so again, efforts in string theory and quantum gravity are attempting to create models that describe this situation. But in my personal opinion, we're going to need some new way of getting more data about what the universe would have been like, some kind of observational data or experimental data on saying, what would the universe have been like in these early stages before we can really identify which of these uh, models are more likely to be correct. Okay, so Planck era, don't really know. We then get to the GUT era uh, from 10 to the minus 43 seconds to 10 to the minus 35 seconds. I should point out, I do not expect students to memorize all of these times. There's a few times from this that I do want students to uh, remember. I will point out what those times are. So in this GUT era, again, we've got these matter anti uh, antimatter energy reactions, lots of these elementary particles. The energy is so high that we're gonna get quarks, electrons, photons, um, all of their antiparticles, all kind of mixing together in this, uh, you know, early universe stew. At the end of this era, well, the, uh, the strong force separates from the GUT force. So this grand unified theory force, it's a proposed force where the strong electromagnetic and the weak nuclear forces are all kind of fused together. This force, this era ends, when the GUT for when the strong nuclear force separates from that GUT force. This might have also been related to a period of what we call inflation, this hyper rapid expansion of space. We'll talk about that a little bit in some of the uh, next sessions as well.
uh, going into more detail on that. Again, this GT era, we still really don't have a lot of uh, information about this. We have some models describing this GT force, but again, lots of open questions. If this inflation period happened, then by the end of this inflation period, the universe would have expanded from like the size of an atom to something comparable to the solar system. At least the visible universe would have expanded that much. Now, when I say that, some of you might have a question about this. The universe in this fraction of a fraction of a second expands from the size of an atom to something comparable to the solar system. But we know that light doesn't travel that quickly. So how would this possibly work? Well, there's kind of some fine print on the statement that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And the fine print is basically this. No objects or information can travel through space faster than light. But what we're talking about here is space itself expanding. And as far as we know, there's no speed limit on how fast space itself can expand. That nothing, the idea of nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, that's nothing can travel through space faster than the speed of light. Space itself, the expansion of space itself, that doesn't have the same kinds of constraints. Okay, so this electroweak era, well, it's when we have this electroweak force. So uh, this combination of the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force. Uh, in this era, matter and antimatter reactions are going to be very common. And at the end of this era, we finally get all four of these fundamental forces. Electromagnetism and the weak forces separate. We have all four of those fundamental forces in there the way that we know them now. And by the end of this era, temperatures have gotten low enough, only a, thou a, a million billion Kelvin, that we can actually reach those energies in particle reactors. Uh, that was the first one ten billionth of a second at the end of the electroweak era. Okay. So again, these particles, uh, these forces have all separated from each other. So again, this gives us our ability to directly un, uh, test our understanding of physics in these conditions. And from this point on, we have quite a bit more confidence in what the universe would have been like. Very early on, not so sure. But let's talk about some of these next eras. So by the end of this era, all four forces have separated for the entire rest of the time. On this diagram, we have the forces are all four of them, strong, electromagnetic, weak, and gravity forces. So at that point, all the forces have separated. So what happens next from that first 10 billionth of a second to about one one thousandth of a second? We have this particle era. This is where we're starting to get matter clumping together. Right now, we're getting quarks starting to uh, combine together to form protons and neutrons. And as I mentioned before, if in these earlier eras, those quarks tried to form together, there's so many high energy particles flying around that it would just bash that thing into pieces, uh, into its constituent parts, essentially immediately. But now we finally start to reach uh, low enough energies where quarks are going to form uh, protons and neutrons. We also have this slight overabundance of matter over antimatter. And in this particle era, some antimatter is still around, but it's starting to die out. By the end of this era, all of the antimatter is gone. And just that little extra bit of matter is remaining. So by the end of this era, all of the free quarks are gone. So let me pull that diagram up a bit again. So at the end of this era of particles, so if this is the particle era, 
at the end of that era, we have no more antimatter and no more free quarks. All of the quarks are now bound together into protons and neutrons. So that's going to be the set of events that marks the end of the particle era. No more antimatter, no more free quarks. Um, all of those quarks are now bound up into protons and neutrons. So now the universe is protons, neutrons, electrons, and photons. This era of nucleosynthesis, this one's going to be uh, very important for some of our evidence for the Big Bang. This first around three or so minutes of the Big Bang, the entire universe is at a high enough temperature and a high enough density that protons can start to fuse together into helium. What's normally reserved for happening in the cores of stars, for a few minutes, this is happening everywhere in the universe. So during this era of nucleosynthesis, these protons are starting to fuse together to form helium nuclei. If those helium nuclei would have tried to have formed earlier on, High energy particles would again come on in and smash those things back apart. And through this era of nucleosynthesis, in this first few minutes of the Big Bang, that hydrogen is going to be able to fuse into helium. But by the time some of the helium builds up, there's not going to be a high enough temperature or high enough density anymore for that helium to fuse into anything heavier. And we know, we have models for how the temperature of the universe would have changed during this era. We have models for how the density of the universe would have changed during this era. And we know how efficiently hydrogen fuses into helium at different temperatures and densities. So by the end of this era, how much of the hydrogen has fused into helium? Well. What we're left with is a universe with three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium. This is the starting state for the composition of the universe. Three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium, super tiny trace amounts of uh, lithium, but basically just the hydrogen and helium. Later generations of stars will take this material and start forming these heavier elements, but the first generation of stars is still a long way off for us. So by the end of this era, the universe's temperature has gone down enough that fusion is going to stop at the end of this era. So once that stops, for the next while, we're going to have this universe having this set composition of 75% hydrogen, 25% helium by mass, and still lots of photons of light flying around, and lots of free electrons. These free electrons, they have a very important property for us. Photons love scattering off of free electrons. So if there are free electrons, light cannot easily pass through that material. It's going to hit a free electron and scatter in a new direction. Hit another free electron, scatter in a new direction. And basically, the universe at this point is going to be like a white hot fog. It's going to be an extremely high temperature, but it's opaque to light. Light can't bounce through there freely because of those free electrons. So the universe is opaque. Okay, so then for the next... 300,000 or so years, uh, probably should have made this a little bit more accurate, 380,000 years approximately. Let me update that one. From three minutes to around 380,000 years, there's no more fusion occurring. Okay, we've just got that three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium. But the temperatures are still too high to capture those free electrons. So those free electrons are still flying around the uh, flying around the universe. And they're going to be scattering those free electrons, or sorry, those uh, photons, 
So all of these free electrons are still scattering that light photons are bouncing around this universe. So let me do a little uh, diagram for this one. So in this era of nuclei, let's say this is the era of nuclei. The universe is opaque. We've got all of these free electrons kind of set up in here. And those photons of light are going to be kind of bouncing around in all sorts of different directions. And every time they bounce around, the properties of that light basically get reset. It's going to be going in a different direction. It's going to, um, when they scatter, the amount of energy those photons can have uh, can change. Um, it basically resets the properties of those photons. But eventually, at the end of this era of nuclei, finally, around this uh, 380,000 year point, let me kind of mark this on here. So time is going this way on this diagram. At 380,000 years, finally, the temperature of the universe has gone down enough that the hydrogen and helium nuclei can start capturing those free electrons and making neutral atoms. So at the end of this era of nuclei, those electrons are going to be captured by the atomic nuclei. And now we have neutral atoms. So this is the era of atoms. And all of those photons of light that were bouncing around, they are going to bounce one more time. And then all of a sudden, those free electrons are gone the universe becomes transparent and those photons can just start flying through the universe essentially unimpeded. That light is going to be very important for us when we talk about the evidence for the Big Bang because we call this the cosmic microwave background. This light that was finally able to move freely through the universe at the end of the era of nuclei and the beginning of the era of atoms. That light that was able to scatter one more time and then travel freely through space, we can still see that light today. We can see the afterglow of the Big Bang uh, in what we call the cosmic microwave background. So at this point, the temperature of the universe is around 3000 Kelvin. So the temp here, is around 3,000 Kelvin. Okay, so that's the end of the era of nuclei. Um, at the end of that era, the electrons are going to be captured by those atomic nuclei and form neutral atoms. So we get this era of atoms. Uh, these photons can now freely travel through space. The universe is transparent. And finally, we get to the time where the universe is mostly the same, but there's these slightly overdense regions, these slightly denser clumps. And gravity is going to start to take those and cause them to collapse into the seeds of galaxies, galaxy clusters, the first stars. And the dark matter that's kind of hiding behind the scenes in all of this is going to also help facilitate how those galaxies are actually forming. This is one of the pictures that we're going to look at of this leftover light from the end of the era of nuclei and the beginning of the era of atoms. That light, like I said, is still traveling around us today. We can still see the leftover light from the Big Bang. And lastly, we have what we, we don't always include this in our list of eras, but this era of galaxies, where Galaxies are going to evolve through this stargas star cycle. Uh, earlier generations of stars start fusing heavier and heavier elements in their cores. They eventually end their lives as supernovas, uh, ejecting those materials and sometimes making even more heavy materials in uh, things further down on the periodic uh, table in those supernova events. And that's going to start mixing with other gas clouds and start forming new generations of stars that include more of those heavy elements. And our own solar system 
was one of those later generations of stars that was seeded with the heavier elements that were formed in earlier generations of stars. So we get this current universe that's full of galaxies. And at this point, when we look at the background light from the cosmic microwave background radiation, the temperature of our universe is around three Kelvin. So we'll talk about the uh, details of this background radiation on another session. Sorry, I have this from a, uh, uh, reset that. I have this from a previous class. We'll talk about this in a future session. Um, this leftover background radiation and that temperature of three Kelvin, where that comes from. So again, there was a lot of information in here and I do recommend having a look through this uh, table. This is posted on, this is gonna be posted on both LONCAP and Blackboard um, to be able to compare and contrast some of these, uh, these eras from the ones that we know very little about to the ones that we have a lot more information on. Um, looking at these uh, different eras and the things that contrast the different eras or the things that mark going from one era to another, like what are some of the events that mark the transitions in these uh, eras? So I do recommend having a look at that, but in terms of numbers to remember, for different times, that first 10 to the minus 10 seconds, that's the special point where all of the forces have separated and we have particle accelerators today that can actually test what uh, how systems act at these kinds of extremely high energies and temperatures. So that's the 10 to the minus 10 seconds. I do want you to remember that. Around three minutes in, this is the end of the era of nucleosynthesis. And at the end of this era, we have a universe that's about three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium by mass. And the other date that I want you to know is around 380,000 years after the Big Bang, that is when we reach the end of the era of nuclei and the beginning of the era of atoms, where finally, those free electrons that were flying around in the era of nuclei, finally the, temp the temperature of the universe has gone down enough that those electrons are gonna start being captured by the atomic nuclei, the hydrogen helium nuclei, start forming neutral atoms and the universe becoming transparent. In terms of temperature, well, around 3000 Kelvin, that's when neutral atoms are going to be able to start to form more effectively. And three Kelvin, that is the current temperature of the universe. So what we're gonna be doing in, the, in some of the future sessions is looking at, okay, this timeline sounds interesting. Sure, we'll go with that. But what evidence do we have to back up this Big Bang model? Why are scientists confident that this model accurately describes, at least to fairly early eras, uh, why are we confident that these models actually describe what the universe would have been like in these very early states? So we're going to be talking about that in some of the next sessions.